Good, good morning, everyone. As most of you know, I'm Rob Davies, the chair of the Master Association Stormwater and Pond Management Committee. Thanks for attending today about the health of Tampa Bay and what our responsibility is to help with that uh, process. Um, each one of us has a responsibility to protect our environment. Things that we do in our front yard um, affect our environment miles downstream from us. Um, our stormwater management system, which includes our ponds, are the first step in controlling downstream pollution, nutrient, and sediment flow uh, into our streams, creeks, rivers, and ultimately Tampa Bay and the Gulf. Uh, we're fortunate today to have Ed Sherwood to help us understand um, the efforts underway to restore and maintain the health of Tampa Bay. Ed Sherwood became Tampa Bay Estuary Program's third executive director in 2018 after serving as the program specialist since 2008. Ed's responsible for maintaining Tampa Bay Estuary Program's strong interlocal partnership agreement, including the Bay science-based restoration and recovery strategies. He directs, uh, what did he call it? TBEP, technical and out, uh, public outreach initiatives and serves as a primary liaison between the many public and private partners. Ed holds a bachelor's in marine biology and a master's in marine fisheries and ecology from the University of Florida. In his spare time, he enjoys boating on the bay, traveling with his wife and two children. And rumor has it that he's one of the good guys, according to one of his staff members. Uh, we want to welcome Ed. Thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all this morning. And thanks for sharing this opportunity with me to learn more about the day and, and the things we do as an estuary program um, to keep the place we know and love in our backyard healthy and, and clean. So my goal for today is to give you a little bit of background of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, some of our guiding management paradigms of, of what we have been doing since the mid 1990s to restore and protect Tampa Bay. And then hopefully give you some ideas of what you could do both at the individual yard level as well as community level to help protect and, and further improve the bay uh, condition. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I'm Ed Sherwood, I'm the director of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, but I also have about eight other staff that help me in this process. Uh, so we are a collection of scientists, community outreach specialists, uh, grant managers, as well as uh, social scientists that are focused on implementing what we call our comprehensive conservation and management plan for Tampa Bay. That's basically our guiding document and, and sets the stage uh, and, uh, of, for the work that we do. So our focus area is the Tampa Bay estuary and its surrounding watershed. That's basically the colored areas on the map there. Uh, they're color coded according to the land uses that are now uh, observed within the watershed. So those yellow areas are agriculture. The red areas are urban, suburban development. Some of the purple areas, as you might know, are, are mining in the eastern part of the watershed. And then the green areas are basically the remaining natural lands, both within the watershed and fringing in the bay. So there's not much of those green areas left, so we want to protect and restore those habitats that are important to the overall estuarine health. Um, and we want to look for opportunities within those developed landscapes to further uh, protect and restore the bay. So anywhere within that colored map area, if a, a raindrop falls, it will make its way into the Tampa Bay estuary, the blue waters the, um, that you probably will aware of, um, that, that are the heart of our region. So my program, we are actually considered a national estuary program. And what that means is uh, Congress back in the early 1990s designated the Tampa Bay estuary as an estuary of national significance. And what that does is direct actual federal dollars to our place-based program. Uh, since about 1996, we actually matched those federal funds with local dollars to develop an interlocal agreement. Basically, that's a, a standing agreement between the federal government and the county and city governments surrounding Tampa Bay uh, that are basically putting skin in the game to help protect and further improve the health of the bay. So we are actually one of 28 national estuary programs scattered throughout the country. 
Uh, there's actually three of the ones in the state of Florida, uh, Sarasota Bay, uh, Charlotte Harbor region, as well as the Indian River Lagoon on the East Coast. There are a couple other programs that are developing uh, in Biscayne Bay and up uh, in Pensacola that are also trying to see this status as a national estuary program. But I, I, I mentioned it uh, before, and one of the, the guiding paradigms for all these programs is what's, what's called uh, the development of our comprehensive conservation and management plan. That's the, bold pr the blueprint that we utilize to guide our activities and, and guide where we're putting our funding uh, both from the federal and local partners uh, that represent our program, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. As I mentioned, there's four county governments, uh, basically the commissioners and city council uh, 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 members from uh, three of the largest cities in the Bay, basically are my bosses that I report to, and those are commissioners and council members uh, represented from Pasco, Pinellas, Hillsborough, Manatee counties, as well as City of Tampa, Clearwater, and St. Petersburg. We also have representatives from the State Department of Environmental Protection, the EPA, as well as the Southwest Florida Water Management District on our policy board. And again, they, they're basically our deciders and who I report to, and whatever actions we're contemplating working on, they basically give the stamp of approval to spend those resources. And I didn't mention at the start, and, and by the way, please, if you all have any questions, I don't mind taking them throughout the presentation. Just raise your hand and I'll, I'll call on you all. I don't mind stopping and, and addressing any questions that you might have as I present this information to you. Um, so as I mentioned, that comprehensive management plan is, is comprehensive in nature. If you go to that link down at the bottom, that'll open up about a 160-page document. That's, I, that's fairly lengthy, but to boil it down, it's basically uh, three program pro programmatic priorities that we operate uh, within. So we're developing projects that are supporting the improvement of water and sediment quality in the Bay. Uh, we're supporting projects that either research or, or provide restoration opportunities for key habitats that support uh, many of the fish and wildlife that call the Tampa Bay Estuary their home. And then we work with the community to kickstart a lot of those, those recovery and restoration activities uh, like I'm doing today, speaking to you all about our, our work. Um, so those, those three pillars are basically where all of our work funnels into. And at the start of our program, one of the, one of the key things that we were working on was the recognition that the bay was not in, in pristine condition back in the 1990s. To a lot of the rapid development that occurred from 1950s to 1980s, the Bay was in a degraded state. We lost about half of the overall seagrass resources within Tampa Bay, and those are the rooted plants under the water that provide a lot of fish and, and habitat um, nursery areas for, for key species that both recreational and commercial fisheries rely on, but they also provide a, a a cleansing action within the bay itself by absorbing absorbing nutrients and carbon and further filter out sediments that, that make its way through the bay. So as I mentioned, we lost about half of the seagrass resources in the bay, primarily due to poor water quality conditions uh, as a result of, of excessive nutrients flowing into the bay and causing algal blooms, which basically shaded out those underwater seagrasses that were rooted to the bottom and didn't allow enough sunlight to penetrate to the bay bottoms to allow those seagrasses to persist in the bay. So our, our primary work has been trying to restore bay water quality for the benefit of restoring seagrasses. And a lot of the work that we've been doing over the past three decades has been fairly successful. We were, we've been actually viewed as a, a national model and, and success story for reducing the amount of nutrients flowing into Tampa Bay. If you look at the pie on the left on the left side, that's basically the amount of nutrients that was flowing into Tampa Bay in the 1970s, basically our worst case scenario. And you can see by the different colors of the pie, the different sources of the major nutrient uh, inputs to the Bay at that time. And then if you look at the pie on the right, basically that's shrunk, shrunk, shrunk a whole lot. Uh, we actually see about two thirds less nutrients flowing into Tampa Bay than we have seen um, back in those battle days in the 1970s. And you probably also noticed that the, the colors of the pie have changed. So the proportions of nutrients coming into the bay have changed a whole lot since the 1970s. And one of the major nutrient inputs to the bay primarily come from what's called non-point sources, basically anywhere when it rains and flows into the bay through stormwater, 
those nutrients are what's um, the major inputs and, and probably causing some of our, our water quality issues in the Bay right now. So a lot of our activities are focused on trying to address stormwater pollution uh, from those non-point sources. Uh, right now it's about 62% of the overall nutrient loads uh, going into t Tampa Bay and that's to the tune of about 2,000 tons. So that's a lot of nutrients uh, that comes from our stormwater that's running off some of our impervious surfaces and then ultimately flowing into creeks, channelized systems that flow out into Tampa Bay. So again, our, our focus is trying to reduce uh, those sources of nutrients um, coming from those major sources uh, for the benefit of improving water quality so that seagrasses can persist and maintain uh, good health in the bay so that could uh, provide that ecosystem function of providing habitat for fish and wildlife as well as, as cleansing the, the water quality in the bay itself. And, and Rob asked me to kind of talk about that uh, key issue of stormwater runoff. There's some really good uh, visualizations and tools. If you look up uh, the upper right-hand corner, that's a website link. I'll be able to provide this presentation to you all. You could can, you can, uh, you know, explore it on your own, uh, in your own time. But basically, it's just showing in an animation form that concept that I talked about, anywhere a raindrop would fall within the colored area in the bay, ultimately makes its way in, in, into the coast and into our estuary. And along that path, hopefully there's opportunities to cleanse that, that water before it reaches the estuary. If not, if it's just hitting basically impervious surfaces, concrete surfaces, and quickly running off, it's probably going to be carrying nutrients and other contaminants directly into the bay and our natural systems. And we want to have an opportunity to cleanse that water before it actually makes its way to the estuary and causes downstream impacts. And you probably are all familiar with sort of the, the hydrologic cycle. Not only is it important for the estuary health uh, to have that cleansing property up in the watershed, but we know that that rainfall also percolates into the groundwater system and provides a lot of our drinking water supply. So of course, we wanna have some polishing effects before it actually reach our drinking water supply. And in our region, we have actually diversified a whole lot where we get our drinking water from. As you all might know, we do actually get some of our water from the riverine systems in the Bay. We do get our water from groundwater, and we also get our water from the bay itself through desalination plant by the, the Big Bend uh, power generating facility in Apollo Beach. So again, it's important that you know we keep that water cycle healthy, um, that we're not introducing contaminants because it not only affects the health of the bay, but it also could affect our health uh, in terms of the water supply that, that we rely on in, in the watershed. Um, so I mentioned, you know, we have been viewed as a, a pretty successful um, uh, recovery story for estuaries, particularly ones that continue to grow in population. Uh, we are continuing to see about a thousand people move to Florida, so our ever-expanding population and the, the building out of our, our watershed has potentially downstream impacts. But despite all that, we've actually have seen a, a really big recovery of seagrass in Tampa Bay up until about 2016. So we actually reached, that red line indicates an overall recovery goal we're shooting for. We're trying to get the same amount of seagrasses in the 1950s um, um, as uh, depicted by that red line back in the Bay. And we hit those targets in 2014, 2016, and actually in 2018. Uh, but since that time, we've actually seen some precipitous declines and I'll show that in, a, in the next animation. This will kind of scroll through each of the assessment years going back to 1988 all the way to present. And you'll see that initial recovery, particularly in the areas in the upper bay, which is shown on the, the map on the left, is where we're re storing, where we recovered seagrasses. And up until that 2016 period, we saw a big resurgence of seagrasses in the upper bay. Um, the upper the two uh, bay segments on the left are called Old Tampa Bay. And the one on the right is Hillsborough Bay, basically where this uh, city of Tampa's downtown is. And that's where we've seen the most recovery of seagrasses up until about that 2016 time period. But after that, as I mentioned, we're starting to see some precipitous declines. We actually, since 2016, have lost about 11,500 acres of seagrass in the bay. And that's, that's something that we don't want to see. Well, it's basically going back to the bad old days of, of what we're, we're trying to avoid in, in the region. 
and that has had impacts as it relates to the overall ecosystem. And you, you all have probably seen the news headlines of some of the base conditions, uh, particularly since the 26 time frame when we've had um, basically peak water quality and seagrass conditions. So currently we're at about 30,137 acres of seagrass in Tampa Bay. And again, we wanna get above that bright red line. So anything we could do to continue to improve water quality is our, our focus, yes ma'am. I'm wondering if there is a correlation between the weather and the changes, or is it just what humanity does in the changes? It's both, actually. So, yeah, we've, we've done some work to, over the past 10 years, we've actually seen more what's called a higher rainfall input into the bay, particularly during the wet season. So we've had wetter wet seasons uh, over the past decade. And we think that was uh, some of the cause of that initial loss from 2016 to at least 2020. You also might remember back in the 2015, 2016 time period, we had really, really high rainfall, which caused uh, what's, what's called sanitary sewer overflows uh, from our wastewater treatment plants. Basically, they were becoming overwhelmed with all the, the surface water that was infiltrating some of our sanitary sewers, and that caused discharges from wa those wastewater treatment plants that basically initiated some more work and investment in that infrastructure to avoid those sanitary sewer overflows, because we don't, we don't want sewers discharging into our bay that introduces both bad bacteria that we don't want in our surface waters as well as nutrients um, so that i think was sort of the the, the kickstart around that that time period and then not long after that we had a, a fairly significant red tide event in the gulf in 2018. Uh, it didn't come too far up into the bay but when red tides occur it kills off a lot of fish and that introduces more nutrients into the system not long after that, if you might recall, in, in 2021, um, we had the Piney Point event, which discharged about a year's worth of nutrients into the bay over a 10-day period. That also caused a significant red tide event in, in later on in 2021 in the bay itself. And that caused a huge fish kill in the bay, introduced more nutrients, and sort of that overwhelming nutrient burden in the Tampa Bay system, I think, is what led to a lot of um, this initial decline over, uh, that, that we have as observed to the 2022 period. Um, some of the good news, and I'll share it at the end, is the past two years in, in 2023, uh, 2022 and 2023, we've actually seen some slight recovery in water quality in seagrasses. So that might be a positive sign that we've gotten past those, those perturbations. And now, hopefully, we're once again on a positive trajectory to restore water quality and, and the seagrass resources in the Bay. But as I mentioned, there, there's been a number of signs of stress from nutrients um, going back to that 2015, 2016 time period. And we think that's what sort of kickstarted this initial loss. Um, one of the things we're grappling with uh, in one of the Bay segments, that upper left-hand lobe of Old Tampa Bay, where the three main bridges that link Pinellas and, and Hillsborough counties, the Gandy, uh, Howard Franklin, and Courtney Campbell, that's basically the old Tampa Bay segment. We've been seeing a, a fairly persistent harmful algal bloom. It's called pyridinium. It's not a red tide, but it creates a crimson color in the water, and it basically blooms every summer. And we also think that's sort of a, a stress to water quality conditions in that bay segment. And, in Old Tampa Bay, that's where we've seen the most significant seagrass losses, uh, basically where there's this co-occurrence of that harmful algal bloom. So this map on the left basically shows uh, from the 2016 to 2022 time period where we've lost the most seagrasses and the darker reds are the areas where we've lost the most. And that, that area up around Feather Sound, uh, just north of the Howard Franklin Bridge, uh, we, that's where we've seen the most acres of seagrass loss. That incidentally is the, the area that we've also seen uh, this persistent summertime algal bloom called pyridinium. Luckily that, that bloom doesn't cause significant fish kills it has in the past periodically. Um, primarily when it crashes, it creates basically a low dissolved oxygen event. Basically it, um, the breakdown of that organic material creates a, uh, low oxygen conditions for fish and wildlife, and there's been periodic fish kills in the past, but it's not as pronounced as a red tide event, um, but it does, it does cause a toxin. 
So it is a concern, and, and one of the strategies is not only trying to look at reducing nutrients, but improving tidal circulation in that bay segment to hopefully get rid of that algal bloom in the future. And as I mentioned, um, we, we track water quality conditions through this simple red, yellow, and green stoplight graphic. This is basically ex, uh, assessing uh, how much algal, al algae are in the water, as well as the light conditions of the water to come up with this simple report card. And that bay segment, Old Tampa Bay, uh, OTB, is the one that has been our problem child where we haven't had consistent water quality uh, through the years. And that's, that's been where we've been focusing a lot. And it's primarily centered around this algal species that kind of capitalizes on uh, the physical water quality conditions in that bay segment, basically the, the bridges we think create for this uh, stagnant environment that this particular algal species can outcompete other non harmful species and you know, reach bloom conditions in the summertime period. So again, our focus is on trying to reduce nutrients going into these areas, but it's also trying to improve tidal circulation. So once the water from the surrounding watershed enters the bay, it could quickly get flushed out of there and that algal species can't capitalize on the nutrients basically can't sit sit there and, and 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 stew on those available nutrients to feed itself and bloom so those those are sort of the strategies we're focused on in in that particular bay segment um, and the interesting thing also during this period we've seen uh, impacts to what's called our, our, our nectin index. And this is basically looking at small bodied fish and crustaceans from the State Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They do uh, monitoring on a monthly basis throughout Tampa Bay. And we sort of track conditions of the nectin, basically the community of fish that are representative in the bay on an annual cycle. And it basically mirrors closely to the loss of seagrass habitat that we've observed since 2016. So. We've actually seen declines in fish populations as a result of the red tide events, as well as uh, potentially the loss of seagrasses uh, from that peak condition in 2016. So again, we're trying to restore those habitats for the benefit of, of a lot of these, these other critters that you know, we love to recreate uh, and or commercially fish within the bay. And you think about redfish, snook, uh, sea trout, flounder, and even grouper are reliant on healthy and persistent seagrass beds. They call those basically their nurseries uh, for those critical small life stages. Um, and they use those estuarine environments to, to grow healthier and get bigger so that they don't uh, you know, get eaten by other fish. So again, those, those habitats are basically sentinel habitats that are foundational to the functioning uh, of our coasts and estuaries that ultimately have uh, effects on our overall economic output as well, because they are important recreational as well as commercial fisheries in the region. So I kind of, the first half of my talk is kind of summarizing where the bay is at and it's kind of boiled down into these three key points. We know we have some issues in the upper bay segments, particularly the old Tampa Bay segment, uh, where we're seeing that algal bloom uh, persistently occur every summer. Uh, we also know that the, the uh, watershed continues to develop and the areas where we could do this restoration work are becoming limited. So we have to seize those opportunities while they, they still are, uh, are there within the watershed before they become houses. Um, so we're kind of competing with the continued development within the region of where we could do this restoration work in the future. And there, there's space for both right now, but at some point we'll reach a tipping point where we'll, we'll run out of those opportunities and have to start making tough decisions of where we could retrofit and do both probably engineered gray green infrastructure uh, to further support water quality and ecosystem functions in the Bay. And then last but not least, you know, the, the community has recognized some of the declines in the Bay, um, uh, you know, going back to some of the red tide events and Piney Point. And we, we have seen a lot more investment in terms of trying to live with nature and, and look for opportunities to do this work. Uh, so we have had great community support and actually have started getting additional uh, public and private funding to help support some of the grant programs that we, we use as seeding, uh, seed funding to, to support some of the activities that we know are needed in the, in the watershed. 
So that that sort of kind of summarizes the, the state of where we're at, and now I'm kind of shift towards actions that you all could think about, uh, both individually and at the community level, and sort of the solutions that we're working on as a program uh, with partnerships through communities like yours. Uh, so. First and foremost, if you don't know um, where our website is, if you go to tvep.org, we have a, a, a variety of different uh, uh, ideas that you could uh, partake both in, at your home uh, and also some uh, grant funding opportunities to consider moving forward to support some of the, the work that we do. But individual actions like not fertilizing during the summer rainy season, uh, reducing your plastic use, um, you know, driving smaller car and, and cars that don't uh, burn as much fossil fuels, that all has a nutrient reduction benefit in the Bay. Um, how you manage your yard in terms of Florida friendly landscaping reduces your overall irrigation and fertilizer needs within your yard, so that has downstream benefits if you're using less of those resources as well as potentially less pesticides or other uh, chemicals to maintain a non-friendly, uh, a non-Florida-friendly uh, yard. So again, some, some really quick ideas. Um, also clean up for your pet. You know, if you leave <laughs> pet waste that uh, allows sort of that waste to run off into the streams and watersheds, and that usually has more of a, a bacteriological implication, uh, creating more uh, bacteriological burden in our water where it's not as safe to swim uh, or our uh, fish in. Uh, but there are also nutrients associated with that, that pet waste that we want to remove and make sure that it's being properly disposed before it runs off into our surface waters. And you know, within your community itself, you could start to think about you know, the, the stormwater system that's probably behind your, your home. Um, this is a pond committee, so you could start thinking about how to fortify some of your stormwater ponds uh, through no-mow zones or creating different opportunities for fish and wildlife to um, you, you, to capitalize on a more natural environment. So if you look at the, the stormwater pond on the left versus the stormwater pond on the right, there's a lot more ecosystem benefits of the pond represented on the right in terms of trapping and assimilating nutrients that might be running off from the surrounding community, as well as trapping carbon in the form of tree and woody material. And then, you know, just supporting overall ecosystem function of, of allowing more fish and wildlife to uh, have opportunities uh, for habitats along that fringing uh, stormwater pond area. And ultimately, like I mentioned, those connections with our water supply are also important. Uh, a, a healthier stormwater pond that isn't basically being maintained through chemical treatment is a lot healthier for our ultimate drinking water system because that water is ultimately perking down into the groundwater system or running off into our surface waters that we're tapping and introducing into our water supply. So it's less of a, a you know, need to further treat that water to get it to drinking water standards as well. Um, one of the, the key things that uh, we've been working on going all the way back to the 2010 time period is uh, the concept of, of uh, being more flirty in, in the way you manage your lawn. Um, I talked about Florida friendly landscaping. That's an important tenant to consider at your home. Uh, and then there are uh, bans on fertilizer use during the summer rainy season. And again, there's more of a propensity for those applied fertilizers to run off during our summer rainy season. We get about 50 to 60 percent of our rainfall uh, in a, a period between June and September typically every year. So if you're fertilizing during those time periods, uh, there's more of a, a, a likelihood that that fertilizer might run off, especially if that fertilizer lands on an impervious surface like your driveway or sidewalk rather than in the grass itself. So again, that, that creates more of an opportunity for those nutrients to get introduced into the stormwater system, the gutters along your streets that ultimately get discharged into a lake that might be, or stormwater pond behind your house, which ultimately discharges to a canal, canal or a creek system that ultimately discharges to the bay. So that nutrient burden just gets amplified the further downstream you look. And we're trying to reduce the amount of nutrients that are flowing into the bay for the benefit of, of maintaining water quality in seagrasses. Um, the other thing I mentioned, you know, during that 2015-2016 time period where we had a, a, a lot of rainfall during the summer, um, that caused what was called sanitary sewer overflows. 
Basically, a lot of our older communities, primarily those built before 1970s, have um, what's called um, uh, poor materials um, from their from our private uh, sewer lateral pipes. Basically, the pipes that lead from your home to the public central sewer that's usually in the road. Those, that run up pipe was, uh, in a lot of these older homes, is made of, of uh, 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 poor materials, uh, orange bird piping, um, some old cast iron piping that is now failing. It's over a half century old at this point. So a lot of that older infrastructure is failing. And when it rains and that rainwater uh, perks under the ground, that introduces a lot more water into those failing private lateral sewer pipes. That water gets conveyed to the wastewater treatment plants and during an excessive rainfall event that overwhelms those, those wastewater plants and that's when spills occur. So we've been working on a campaign called Pipe Up. There's several communities, particularly in Pinellas, uh, City of St. Pete and City of Gulf Board have been pursuing programs to help homeowners out to uh, inspect and or repair or replace those failing private lateral systems, particularly in older communities where, they're, where this infrastructure might be uh, uh, represented. And again, that's trying to you know, fix our, our old uh, piping systems of the past uh, so that we don't have these excessive nutrients flowing into the bay from uh, an issue that we know can be fixed. And this could be costly, that's why there are incentive programs being rolled out. Uh, this is actually the responsibility of the private homeowner because it's on private property. It's the run of pipe from your house to the, the central sewer system. And depending on how long that run of pipe is, it could be upwards of like $15,000 just to replace that pipe. Especially if it goes underneath your driveway, you have to tear up your driveway to replace that pipe. So it could be fairly costly. And that's why there's programs being rolled out now by a lot of the municipal governments to help help homeowners out and in, in, uh, sharing that burden of replacement. And as I mentioned, you know, a lot of the work that we do as the SJ program is trying to find the opportunities to do uh, th these uh, restoration activities. Uh, we know that there are diminishing opportunities within the watershed as we can continue to develop. Um, the graph on the right is basically showing the progression of those different land uses, basically the developed environment and all the, the habitats that, that we're interested in managing for in the Bay in 1990 versus 2020 was the last uh, major land use update. And you see the flow of where we could do restoration in that restorable brown bar has diminished a whole lot. And you know, those areas are the, the areas that we continue to develop. and that. There's space to do both, as I mentioned, but we're losing those opportunities through time through continued development. And at some point, we're gonna run out of land where we can do both. And that's where we have to start thinking proactively on, on seizing these opportunities to maintain a certain amount of water quality um, and ecosystem function. Did you have a question, sir? So, you know, just over that 30 year time period, you know, developed lands have increased by about 15,000 acres and the the available restorable lands have decreased by about 17,000 acres. So the next 30 years, you know, we'll probably see the same trend and that, that pie is gonna to continue to shrink uh, within the watershed. So as I mentioned, a lot of the work we're focused on is trying to provide some uh, catalyst funding through several grant programs that we administer. Uh, one large one is called our Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund or TBRF for short. Um, uh, this fund is actually open right now. We're asking for proposals through March 13th, uh, and the, that will fund a lot of the work that we, I've been talking about in terms of restoring um, uh, stormwater systems, addressing some of these aging wastewater infrastructure issues. Uh, so please look at that as a potential opportunity that your community could um, you know, seek a proposal on uh, for activities that might be beneficial to your community. Uh, we also have a smaller grant program called our Bay Mini Grant Program that's funded by a specialty license plate that's shown there on the bottom left. If you ever seen the green uh, license plate with a tarpon on it, the big silverfish, that actually helps fund that Bay Mini Grant Program. Um, so if you uh, purchase that specialty license plate through the DMV, those funds come back actually to the Tampa Bay watershed in the form of those Bay Mini Grants. And we usually fund 
school groups, homeowner associations at a, 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 little, a smaller community-based level, about $5,000 to $10,000 grants. The TBIR funds are actually much more. Uh, we fund projects anywhere to 50 to a couple hundred thousand. This year we have about $700,000 available for the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund to do uh, this sort of work. And there's some examples there. If you've ever been up uh, in Safety Harbor, uh, some of the new boardwalk area used to be just basically grass. They actually restored some of the connection to the bay in that area and allowed some of this marsh grass to come back. So the before and after of that Safety Harbor waterfront. And we'll, we funded a lot of projects like that. Um, they're called living shoreline projects, but you could think about similar sort of things along some of your stormwater ponds, uh, sort of rewilding some of those systems and creating these additional habitat benefits uh, on those systems. And we know that sort of thing has a has a benefit not only to you know the overall aesthetic of the environment, it also creates recreational opportunities in forms of passive parks. Uh, you think about some of the large preserves like Cockroach Bay Preserve, Robinson Preserve. They're also passive parks that people love to go and recreate. And then we've also uh, funded research that that shows that if you build it, uh, they will come. So juvenile tarpon, juvenile snook, juvenile redfish, juvenile sea trout, all access these newly restored places and, and uh, use them as nursery habitat as we build them. And again, that just has a benefit for the overall adult populations once they, they grow up to catchable size that has both tourism related dollar impacts as well as recreational commercial fishery impacts. So as I mentioned, um, our, our tarpon tag actually benefits our Bay Mini Grant program. Going back to uh, around the 2000s when we first started that, it actually brought back about $2 million in total just from those sales back to the region to fund uh, a little over 500 Bay Mini Grant projects. So currently we have about 7,000 license plates um, registered within the state, but we're always trying to increase that. Just That just allows more funding to come back into the form of these Bay Mini Grant programs that we administer on an annual basis. We usually call for applications for that uh, grant program uh, towards the tail end of summer. Uh, and then we make a decision at our November board meeting to fund a certain amount of projects. And any, any year we're funding anywhere from about 20 to 30 different projects um, uh, that are proposed to us. Uh, the much larger grant program that we administer, uh, going back to, uh, I think the about 2012 time period, uh, we funded over about 7 million projects at this point uh, with about 12 million in leverage funds uh, that support larger scale restoration through our Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund. The link is over there on the left uh, and you can get details on how to apply for that. Uh, this is currently open and we're asking for applications um, by March 13th. Uh, as I mentioned, we have about 700000 available uh, to support this, this grant fund. We advertise it every year and we have about that much every year to put back into the community in the form of larger scale restoration activities. So again, why, why are we making these sort of investments? Because they not only have environmental benefits, we know they have economic benefits for our region. We are a tourism driven economy. Uh, people live, work, and play in Tampa Bay because there's a beautiful bay, there's a beautiful environment. Um, a lot of that uh, beautiful environment supports uh, businesses in the form of restaurants, hotels, as well as tourism activities like kayaking, fishing, uh, recreating on our beaches. And if we stand up, lose a whole lot if we go revert the bay back to those bad old days where we had poor water quality, if we had persistent red tide, red tide or harmful algal blooms occurring each year, uh, and that is in the form of lost jobs. About one in 10 jobs are dependent on uh, healthy Tampa Bay. It equates to about 32 billion on an annual economic uh, basis to our region. And then the habitats that I mentioned before, those marshes, mangroves, seagrasses, uh, coastal wetlands, all those are important in terms of that filtration function. And they're actually working for us for free right now, if we, if we allow them to. We can actually put dollar values on the amount of nutrients that are removed by the systems versus having to invest in like a stormwater, a regional stormwater facility or a larger wastewater treatment plant. And those numbers basically equate to those bottom uh, numbers on the, on, on the, the last set of, of figures. 
It equates to about $1.7 billion in free services to us just for allowing those habitats to persist. So that's removing nutrients, that's storing carbon, that's avoiding flood uh, issues in, in terms of the, the flood protection benefits that those habitats represent along our coast and along our freshwater wetland system. So if we just allow them to persist, there's an inherent benefit economically to us in forms of reduce insurance costs and, and these other um, uh, ecosystem uh, benefits that are, are relayed there. Um, there's a larger report that's linked at the bottom and it actually kind of breaks down how these numbers were arrived at within the region. And we plan to do this periodically just to show the benefits of why we're making these investments because they, they return to us you know, a hundredfold in terms of economic benefits to the region. So that was kind of real quick overview and summary of the work we're doing and, and how we you all could get involved in, in our work. But you know, the, the primary thing I wanted to drive home is, you know, we, we've been able to work collaboratively uh, for quite some time for the benefit of restoring the bay. Um, lately, we're seeing some of the bays decline in terms of these large scale perturbations that have caused uh, significant seagrass losses. And that just reinforces the idea that we need to continue to make investments in our natural systems. We have to think about how we live on the, uh, the land and, and the watershed. If there's an expectation of a thousand people moving to Florida um, every day, that you know, there's only finite space where we could do um, both development activities as well as preserve some of the natural aesthetic that brings those people to Florida in the first place. So we have to take a balanced approach and make sure that we're reserving these spaces for nature to persist and allow sort of the function of that nature to help us live on the coast in a sustainable fashion. So those sort of objectives are what we're focused on at the estuary program and we're looking for communities like yours to help us out in the long run. So I'll stop there, entertain any questions that you all might have and hopefully I, I give you a little bit of background on, on where we're at in the Bay. Usually people can hear me no matter where I am. <laughs> my name is Sheila Raskin. I live in Brookfield. And my question is, what is the preferred look to the perimeter of our ponds? Should we have grass? Should we have sand? Should we have rock? Should we have nothing? Thank you. Yeah, if you think about what, what Florida was before we started developing, it looked more like on the right. So if you think about some of the isolated freshwater systems, wetland systems, they look more like that than like that. So returning and rewilding some of those systems to that, that right side is probably, um, provides more of an ecosystem benefit and also creates downstream benefits for the polishing function of those, those habitats. So no mow zones, um, you know, not mowing all the way down to the water surface is usually preferred. Um, how do you respond um, to some of our residents? Because um, personally, on the right, I mean, I like a healthy pond. I want, I want it to be healthy. I want it to be some of our residents who like it looking on the left and saying, I don't want to spend money. Why do we spend money in plants? Why do I have to look at plants? Does that really affect, how does that really affect the whole water thing? And how do you respond to those residents? Yeah, and if you think about the right versus the left, it usually the immediate thought is that this costs more to maintain. That actually costs less to maintain in the long run than the, the uh, thing on the left. I'm sure your community pays for um, management of this on the left, right? I'm sure there's, there's a certain amount invested towards chemical or other treatment to uh, create the, the look on the left. And that, you know, I talked about balance. Everyone has a different idea and concept of, of what the right aesthetic is for their community. So a balance between the two is probably a compromise you could seek within the community. But only having the left is probably not ideal. Uh, and it's gonna cost more in the long run than having a mix of uh, ponds that are represented on the right.
Have you seen, so what we have to do is we have to find a compromise. Yeah. Between the right and the left. Yeah, right? It's the story of our society lately, right? right? right. <laughs> story of every marriage and everything, right? Compromise. So have you seen any examples of communities that have accomplished that? Yeah, yeah. And there, there's a um, couple of communities further south in Sarasota County that have been starting to be developed with this aesthetic more so in their stormwater um, systems. Uh, if you think about Lakewood Ranch, it's a good example. Uh, further south, I'm forgetting the name of the community that uh, weathered the last hurricane fairly well. It was the interior. You know, they have more of these naturescapes um, within their communities themselves. A lot of what we're dealing is, with is so the progression of development that has occurred within a region going all the way back to the 1950s. The latest stormwater rules um, weren't imposed until 1985 that were kind of promoting more of this aesthetic and more of a polished, uh, you know, thinking about the ecosystem in terms of the polishing function of those stormwater systems above and beyond just flood protection. So a lot of the, the newer developments might have better functioning stormwater systems than some of the older ones that are, are more prescribed to this older sort of um, design. And originally, a lot of those designs were just for the function of removing water from the landscapes of people's houses when, when flood. That was the primary consideration for a lot, of, a lot of the stormwater systems that were built prior to 1985. We, we realized since that time that there's a better way to do to, to do that, so it's kind of how do you how do you find a balance to move, especially uh, communities that have been uh, developed over different life um, lifespans in the watershed? How we how do we think about rewilding is the term I use uh, some of those systems so that they're providing more of an ecosystem function than just flood protection to the surrounding communities, and it's sh striking the right balance that makes sense for. You know, the, de the de development that you're working in. You're not going to be able to do that in everywhere because we developed a lot of areas that shouldn't have been developed and were wetlands. <laughs> and and we need that flood protection sort of function of, of some of those older stormwater systems if we want to continue to live there. Question. Yep. Uh, the pond on the left, obviously, the grass is cut, that grass clipping goes into the pond also. What are the effect of those clippings on the pond? Yeah, it's just more added nutrients to the system. So you probably then have to manage for algal blooms that are probably gonna occur within that system. And that's usually in the form of algicides and other chemicals to kind of control or suppress uh, the reassimilation of the nutrients in the system. That's why actually that there's a fountain there that actually helps promote the breakdown of that organic material and alleviate some of the algal blooms. And you, you don't need that in a system like that on the, on the right. Does that ultimately affect the amount of sediment in that pond? Yep. And the, the storage function of that pond over time, if it's not maintained or dredged out, yeah. It's just a buildup of organic material at the bottom. Is there some type of gauge or guide as to how much sediment you allow in a pond? If you, if you go back to sort of the stormwater plans and the as-builts, usually when you're looking at the function of that system, it's returning to that as-built function. That's usually on five, 10, or 15 year cycles of trying to maintain a certain level of storage volume in those systems. And if they haven't been addressed in decades, you probably have a significantly uh, reduced amount of storage capacity in those systems. So then the practice should be, you know, just throwing some thoughts out there, plantings first to make sure you got uh, the ability to filter out some of that with plants, right? Well, yeah, it will help avoid actually having to introduce those clippings into the surrounding pond. It will be assimilated in some of the plant material um, uh, on the fringing um, wetland area on the pond. Uh, any thought on how far out that no mow zone should go? Because, and I'll use an example here in the community. So, uh, one association may own 
the land directly around the pond and another association may own the land 10 feet from that pond. My, my guidance usually on buffers is the wider the better. So as, as wide as the community is willing to go, I think is best for the overall health of that lake system. To help us sell this though, <laughs> what, what, what would be the minimum you would want to see? Yeah, for no mow zones or not fertilizing up to the, the waterfront is like 10, 15, I think it's 10 to 15 feet. That's actually in the, the current uh, residential fertilizer standard for um, Hillsborough County. So there's guidance on that buffer zone within those uh, ordinances. Is that a recommendation or a regulation? It's an ordinance for not fertilizing during the summer months and maintaining a 10 to, foot, a 10 to 15 foot buffer of no fertilization and no mow zones. Ordinance, so that's a regulation. Yep. Does the golf course have to do that too? No, the, the golf courses are outside of the residential. <laughs> yeah. question, question about, again, sediment. Is there another method besides dredging to remove sediment? There are, you could also, uh, kind of like what the fountain is doing, you could actually put oxygen bubblers uh, in your stormwater system that further helps oxidize the sediments and break down those sediments over time. That, that's usually not a quick process though, especially if you have like a couple of decade legacy of, of muck built up in, in those ponds, it's not gonna happen overnight. You're probably gonna have to aerate the system, which requires electricity and cost to do that, uh, probably for a couple of years to reduce that overall muck burden if it's built up. Uh, a good example of that is actually, if, if you've ever been to Lake Thananasasa, it's probably one of our, what's called most eutrophic lake, as historically received a lot of nutrients its muck layer is like eight foot deep if you like swam down to the bottom you could stick a pole uh, you know eight foot deep that's how much muck is in the bottom of lake thanasasa and there's been various activities trying to remove the amount of nutrients flowing into that system but over time it's going to take probably decades to overcome that eight foot burden where there's balance restored in that lake system, so it's not considered eutrophic. So they're not quick fixes, especially for systems that you kind of maintain, it's called a non-natural look. It's gonna take a while to restore balance in a system that might be building up a lot of these legacy nutrients, uh, nutrients and pollutants at the bottom. Yes, ma'am. I've been told that the island in our pond is sinking. How can that be? That's a good question. I, if it was a sort of a wetland feature in the middle of it, um, you know, it, the underlying sediments might, the, the vegetation itself might not be maintaining enough of, um, you know, the production to maintain its, its elevation within the pond itself. Because there was a lot of uh, cypress trees, of course they died, mm -hmm. and now all those are falling. Birds have nowhere to go. And that's what it's supposed to be a bird sanctuary. Yeah, and, and if you're having large trees die off, there's, that's a sign that something's out of whack with that system. Um, and it, if you're seeing trees die, that's usually associated with the, the water elevation. Either they're being inundated for too long or they're not, um, there's not a drying out period being allowed so that those sediments can build up and they can maintain that structure above a certain water level elevation. The, yeah. the governor's office made some mention in the Tampa Times that they were going to uh, put the uh, fertilizer regulation on hold that local municipalities have. Is that something that you've dealt with or not? Yeah, so locally, we're, we've been actually ahead of the game in our region for uh, quite some time. Uh, so we actually have had ordinances in place uh, going all the way back to 2010 in certain municipalities. Hillsborough County was actually the, the latest county to implement the, the fertilizer ordinances, and that was about the 2018 period. So our region is fairly safe in terms of 
um, what's happening at the state level. There was a IFAS, um, basically evaluation that was submitted to the legislature this past year, which was in response to the hold on further fertilizer ordinances being implemented throughout the state. It's uncertain what the state legislature is gonna do this, this session. Um, I'm hoping that they're not gonna preempt ordinances that are already in place, like we have within our region, uh, but it could you know, affect other regions that don't have any ordinances right now. Uh, so there is that fear that this tool by a lot of the um, municipal governments can't, won't be, they won't be able to access or utilize this sort of tool and they'll have to think about other more costly interventions oftentimes than you know, speaking to the residents about reducing nutrient fertilizer use during the summer rainy season, they'll probably have to think about engineered solutions like large stormwater systems to further treat that. So it's just basically shifting the expense, whereas the ordinances are, are uh, sort of no cost solution um, for the community. Um, you have to think about other interventions that have to be uh, imposed in this place for those, those municipalities that don't have any ordinances uh, right now. But like I said, luckily our, our region has had ordinances in place and as long as the legislature doesn't preempt those existing ordinances, um, hopefully we'll be safe through this legislative cycle as well. Good morning. Yes. Uh, you had mentioned the grant program that you're looking for uh, proposals for in March. Is that for the spring planning season this year or would that be for later on? So uh, you would submit a proposal by that March 13th deadline that we then go through a review committee and I bring that to my board for a funding recommendation and those projects would then usually get an agreement in place uh, by the end of the summer, early fall is sort of the target and that would basically kickstart that project. Um, the funding for that larger grant fund, we usually look at projects and that have a lifespan about two to three years. And are those projects very similar to what we're looking at here on the screen? Would they fall into that category? Yeah, um, stormwater, other uh, green infrastructure is called, like looking for nature-based solutions like that's shown on the right. Those would all qualify for that grant fund. Are there restrictions on the entities that would that own the pond or under the dry ground? So the, the entity that applies has to be either a government, nonprofit, it can't be a strictly private business. So that would be the only restriction. If it was a private interest, um, interested in applying, they would just need to partner with a, a nonprofit or a government entity. Okay. And there has to be a long-term sort of conservation easement placed on any uh, restoration work that those dollars would go towards. So as a typical example for our community, it would not be uncommon that the club link development golf course would own the pond, the surrounding ground would be owned by, well, this say the word King's Point, um, is that a of those, that type of project? I, yeah, I talked to Rob about this, and I think it, as long as your association was the lead on it, um, they would qualify for that grant funding, because you're a 501c3, I think you mentioned. Or, Rob, when you say association, you mean Pond committee, we're good. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> we're good. That's what I learned. Other questions? Well, Ed, thanks very much. Absolutely, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity next time. You had all the slides I wish I had. <laughs> um, all these slides will be up on the master website as well as the video of the presentation. Um, so uh, you can, you, you'll be able to see some of the links around the bottom. It would be nice if we can move the projector up about a foot so the bottom doesn't, doesn't have a problem here. Um, thank, I, I appreciate all of you coming. I'm sorry you didn't bring 10 friends um, next time. And the next presentation is on the 22nd. You'll probably be hearing from me so some of you probably don't want to show up. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do a Pond 101, and, and particularly for new people um, or people that haven't attended uh, those in the past, uh, we're going to start over again so we keep, keep uh, the educational process going. And as always, if you're interested in volunteering to help out with the committee's work, we're interested in talking with you. And if no other questions, uh, thanks so much and have a pleasant afternoon.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.